Hello everyone, I'm Chris and this is a full recap of Dune, released in 2021. If you end up enjoying this video and want to see more from us, then make sure to click that subscribe button and click the bell to know anytime we upload a new video. Since the beginning of Frank Herbert's sixth novel Dune Saga in 1965, there have been a few attempts to bring the series to life through film, but none have come anywhere close to reaching the success that 2021's Dune did, with it bringing in $402 million worldwide at the box office on a budget of $165 million, and truly being one of the best films of the year. So with the project being such a huge success, both critically and financially, it only makes sense that a sequel would soon hit theaters as well with Dune Part 2 releasing on March 1st. But before the new film, we've decided to take a look back at and run down everything that took place in Part 1. The movie opens with a narration from a currently unknown Fremen woman of the desert planet Arrakis, who explains to us that, since even before she was born, her people's homeworld has been under the cruel rule of House Harkonnen, who by controlling the production of the planet's spice, the most valuable substance in the universe as it's necessary for interstellar travel, have grown obscenely rich, even richer than the Emperor, ruler of the known universe. One day though, the Harkonnen's reign over Arrakis is suddenly ended, as the Emperor has decided to turn the planet over to House Atreides, which brings us to their homeworld of Caladan in the year 10191, who were first introduced to Paul Atreides, the only son and heir of Duke Leto Atreides, as Paul awakens from a recurring dream of the Fremen woman we'd met in the narration, before joining his mother Jessica for breakfast. Here we learn of the voice, a manipulation of speech perfected by the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, which Paul's mother is a member of, used to gain control over someone, and which Jessica has been trying to teach him how to use but he doesn't seem to fully have it down quite yet. Following breakfast, Paul returns to his frequent studies of the Fremen and Arrakis in preparation of the day's ceremony to officially name House Atreides as Arrakis' new rulers. And through his studies, we come to learn that to the Fremen, spice is also very valuable, but for a different reason as it's a sacred hallucinogen which preserves life and brings enormous health benefits, with their long exposure to spice giving the tribe their characteristic blue eyes, referred to as the eyes of Ibad. The Fremen's living conditions are also explained through his studies, as the harsh weather, including powerful sandstorms capable of cutting through metal, as well as them having to share the deep desert with giant sandworms, known to them as Shai Halud, makes life outside cities hostile. Soon after this, the ceremony begins, with House Atreides being met by the Herald of the Change, members of the Imperial Court, representatives of the Spacing Guild, and the Truthsayer to officially be given control of Arrakis. Although it's clear to Leto that this decision wasn't made with good intentions, a thought he expands on further with Paul, explaining his belief that the real reason they've been allowed control over Arrakis is so they could be left vulnerable to an attack. So Leto's put a plan in motion to arrange an alliance with the Fremen, sending his advance team led by Duncan Idaho, House Atreides' fiercest warrior, to travel to Arrakis and find them. Meanwhile, on the homeworld of House Harkonnen, Gady Prime, their leader, Lord Baron Vladimir, is met by his nephew, Glossu Ribon, who's furious about their removal from Arrakis, but Vladimir eases Ribon's nerves, claiming their removal presents them with an opportunity to eliminate House Atreides. Sometime later, Paul is trained by another of his father's top men, Gurney, who spars with him in their bodily shields, a protective energy force that can only be penetrated by a slow-moving blade. Although Paul's progressed well through his training, he still doesn't fully understand the danger they're in, so Gurney emphasizes that, when the necessity arises, he has to be ready, warning him that the Harkonnens are more brutal than any enemy they've faced. The burden weighing on Paul's shoulders is compounded further later that night, when he's awoken by his mother and taken to meet the Reverend Mother, Gaius Helen Mohayam, her former teacher at the Bene Gesserit School and current truthsayer to the Emperor. Before presenting him to her, Jessica has trusted house physician Dr. Yui check his vitals, who while doing so, warns Paul about the Bene Gesserit saying that although they claim to serve the greater good, they also serve their own designs. Paul is then brought before Mohayim, who uses the voice to force him to kneel at her feet, before putting him through an incredibly painful test of his impulses to see if he's worthy of the power he inherits from his mother, which requires him placing his hand in a box and to be subjected to an excruciating amount of pain while she holds a poison needle called the Gamja Bar to his neck. And although struggling to keep his composure at first, Paul is eventually able to let go of his fear and seemingly numb himself to the pain. So Mohayim promptly releases him. Following this, Mohayim exits with Jessica and scolds her for giving birth to Paul when she was told to only bear a woman, but Jessica has belief that she'd actually birthed the Kwisatz Haderach, although Mohayim doesn't appear to share her same faith. 
Mohayam then exits and Jessica is confronted by Paul, who had overheard their conversation, and so she's forced to reveal her true intentions, explaining that the Bene Gesserit serve as powerful partners to the Great Houses, using their power to steer the politics of the Imperium from the shadows. And for thousands of years, they have carefully crossed bloodlines to bring forth a mind powerful enough to bridge space and time, past and future, whom they call Kwisatz Haderach. Jumping ahead a few weeks now into House Atreides' arrival on Arrakis, where they're promptly welcomed by Thafir Hawat, head of House Atreides' security division, along with the rest of the advance team. While the Fremen also watch on from afar, chanting towards Paul, Lisan al Gaib, meaning voice from the outer world and Messiah. Jessica believes the Bene Gesserit must have been at work planning ideas in their heads, and explains that for centuries, the Fremen have waited for Lisan al Gaib, whose presence they see signs of through Paul. But Paul believes they're only seeing what they've been told to. Later, after House Atreides settles into Arrakeen, the capital of Arrakis that lies behind a large natural wall that works as a shield to protect it from the powerful sandstorms, Paul continues his studies, learning that the sandworm is attracted to rhythmic noises. So when the Fremen cross desert spaces, they use a dance-like motion with a regular rhythm called the sandwalk. But Paul's research is suddenly interrupted upon him noticing a hunter seeker enter the room, a deadly poisonous tool remotely controlled by an operator close by, which comes flying towards his eye, but luckily for him, he's able to catch and destroy the machine. And this attempt on Paul's life puts the house on high alert. The following day, Leto is informed by Duncan of his encounter and subsequent four weeks spent with the Fremen, revealing that they live in communities called a siege, with there being about 10,000 people living in each of hundreds of different sieges. And along with him, Duncan's also brought the leader of his siege, Stilgar, who respectfully orders them not to seek their sieges or trespass their lands, and to just dig their spice and leave the desert to the Fremen, which Leto can't definitively promise, but claims the Fremen's sieges will be theirs forever and that they'll never be hunted while he governs there. Later, Leto, Paul, and Gurney are invited to a tour of the spice harvesting operation in the desert, led by Dr. Liet Kynes, the judge of change, as appointed by the emperor. For this tour, they're given high efficiency filtration systems called still suits, which as Kynes explains, cool the body and recycle water lost from sweat, since they wouldn't survive two hours in the desert without it. While on the tour, they notice a sandworm in the distance, being drawn to the rhythmic sound the harvester emits. So the crew calls a carry wall to lift the crawler, but unfortunately, one of the carry wall's anchors is dead. So they're forced to quickly fly over to the crawler and transfer the crew aboard their small squadron of ornithopters. While helping the crew get onto the ship though, Paul nearly falls victim to the sandworm upon inhaling the spice and subsequently falling to his knees while visions of the Fremen woman are once again triggered, who kisses and stabs him as the words Kwisatz Haderach awakes are whispered repeatedly. But luckily, before he can be devoured, he's grabbed and held back to the ornithopter by Gurney. Upon their return to Arakeen, Leto confronts Kynes, frustrated that everything they've been left with is in shambles and that they've been set up to fail, but Kynes reveals that she isn't at liberty to offer them any help. Paul, meanwhile, after being checked on by Dr. Yui once again, explains his visions to his mother, describing it as seeing his own death, only it wasn't, and that a knife is important somehow claiming that someone will hand him a blade someday. But although most of what he saw has left him puzzled, some things are now crystal clear, like the fact that Jessica is pregnant. Later, Jessica tries to tell Leto what's been going on with Paul, but Leto claims he doesn't want to know, and just asks that if anything happens, for her and the Bene Gesserit to protect Paul, which she claims she'll be sure to do with her life, but can't confirm that the Bene Gesserit will as well. Throughout all this, Mohayam had traveled to Gedi Prime and met with the Baron, to whom she explains that the Emperor will support their battle to take over House Atreides and will strengthen them with his starter car army, but insists that Jessica and my extension Paul are under the protection of the Bene Gesserit, so they shall not be harmed and should be allowed the dignity of exile, to which Vladimir agrees. But his true intentions are soon revealed following her exit, with him making it clear to his servant, Peter de Vries, that no Atreides will survive. So that night, the Baron's plan goes ahead, with the Harkonnen and Sardaukar armies invading Arrakis and attacking House Atreides, thanks to their communications being jammed and shields being dropped by Dr. Yui, who also finds Leto, who had been awakened by flashing lights outside, and shoots him in the back with a Hunter Seeker that penetrates his bodily shield and poisons him, leaving him paralyzed. And here we learn why Yui was forced to turn on House Atreides as he reveals to Leto that the Harkonnens have captured his wife Wana and are taking her apart like a doll. So he had no choice but to make a bargain with the Baron in order to gain his wife's freedom. Yui is still somewhat loyal to Leto though, and so he replaces one of his teeth with a fake that when crushed, will fill the air with poison. Yui then takes Leto to be brought before the Baron, while the rest of House Atreides is presumably killed in the battle, outside of Paul and Jessica, who are instead kidnapped, 
as the Harkonnens plan on dumping and leaving them to die in the desert. But the two actually manage to avoid being tossed out of their aircraft after Paul, with help from his mother using sign language, successfully uses the voice on one of the Harkonnen and forces them to remove his mother's gag, who then uses the voice herself in order to kill them before safely landing the ship. Meanwhile, the Baron is gifted the helpless Leto by Dr. Yui, who, having held up his end of the bargain, Vladimir allows to join his wife in death by cutting his head clean off. He then turns his focus back to Leto, proud to end the Atreides bloodline forever. But just then, Leto bites down on the poison-filled tooth and releases it into the air, killing everyone in the room, although unfortunately not the Baron, who managed to avoid most of the poison's effect thanks to his bodily shield and by flying up to the ceiling before doctors arrive. Back to Paul and Jessica though, whose ship's power is unfortunately killed by the Harkonnens, and so they're still ultimately left stranded in the desert. Although they do find a Fremkin in the ship, inside of which is Leto's ring, and a note left by Dr. Yui, who reveals that Leto is dead. As they try to make it through the night, Paul once again inhales spice from their tent, and has another vision, this time of a holy war spreading across the universe in his name. Jessica tries to calm him down, but he instead yells at her, claiming the Bene Gesserit made him a freak, before tearfully falling into her arms. To their surprise the next morning, they're found by Duncan, who'd managed to escape Arakeen in an ornithopter, and Dr. Kynes, who he'd met and convinced to help them. So the group is then taken by Kynes to an old ecological testing station to keep them hidden, and there, Paul tries convincing Kynes to testify to the great houses that the Emperor made a move against the Atreides. But she and his mother don't see that as a necessarily good idea, since if they believed her, the general warfare between the great houses and the emperor would result in chaos. So Paul instead determines that he'll have to make a play for the throne. This discussion is soon interrupted though, when the Sardaukar suddenly arrive at the building and begin killing the Fremen inside en route to locating the remnants of House Atreides. So in order to stop that from happening, Duncan enters into battle with the soldiers alone, locking the others out and ultimately sacrificing his life to ensure their escape. With Paul and his mother flying off in an ornithopter, while Kine stays behind, since there are only two seats available in the aircraft. Soon enough though, the two end up being chased straight into a sandstorm by the Sardaukar, causing them to lose control of the ship, during which Paul sees another vision of a Fremen man, telling him to move with the flow of the process of life, and hears voices telling him to let go. And so he does, which actually ends up helping them survive the storm, with them eventually crash landing in the desert. Kynes, meanwhile, sets down a thumper, a device that creates a rhythmic thump in the ground to attract the sandworm. But moments after planting it, she's suddenly stabbed through the back by the Sardaukar troops. So before she dies, she pounds the ground and attracts Shai Hulud, resulting in the soldiers being killed by the creature alongside her. Meanwhile, on Gedi Prime, the Baron is met by Raban and is informed of Paul and Jessica's assumed demise. So the Baron next orders him to begin selling their spice reserves and to kill all of the Fremen. Back with Paul and Jessica now, as they sandwalk across the deserted area on their way to a nearby siege, but their attempt to avoid Shai Hulud's attention ultimately seems to have failed as the creature begins rushing towards them. But luckily, a Fremen sets off a thumper to draw Shai Hulud away. This isn't completely a good thing though, as they're then surrounded by the group of Fremen, which includes Stilgar and the man Paul had just seen in his vision, Jameis, the former of whom recognizes Paul from his earlier conversation with Leto, and decides to give him sanctuary since he's still young and can learn their ways. The same is not the case for Jessica, however, as she's ordered to be killed, but their attempt to do so is quickly thwarted by the two, with Jessica specifically besting Stilgar, so he offers peace and allows them to be brought back with them to their siege, Teber. Upon this agreement, Paul is finally introduced to the Fremen woman of his dreams, Chani, who reveals to him that, although her her people believe he's the Lisan Agaib, she does not. She doesn't object to allowing them into their siege though, unlike Jameis, who angrily invokes the Amtel rule, a battle to test a being's limits against Jessica. But Stilgar refuses to allow Jameis to challenge her, so he instead challenges Paul, who agrees to fight on her behalf. Before the battle, Paul once again hears voices, this time telling him that he must die for Kwisatz Haderach to rise, and to take a life is to take his own until these visions are interrupted by Chani, who although not believing he's the Lisana Gaib, wants him to die with honor. So she gifts him the blade from his visions, a curse knife made from a tooth of Shai Hulud for his battle. Upon receiving the blade, Paul and Jameis' battle commences, and to the surprise of many, Paul quickly manages to best Jameis and urges him to yield. But Stilgar reveals that under the Amtel rule, there is no yielding, and so Paul is forced to reluctantly commit his first kill. Hearing the voices say, 
Kwisatz Haderach climb up and rise as he does. His victory in combat then results in him and his mother being officially accepted into their siege by Stilgar, who declares he's one of them now. And although Jessica insists they need to figure out a way to get Paul off-world, Paul decides he must stay with the Fremen and fight the Emperor alongside them, claiming his road leads into the desert, before the movie ends with the group walking into Siege Tavern as a Fremen riding atop a sandworm passes by. And that was our recap of Dune. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. And also let us know in the comments below what you thought of the film. But once again, thank you all so much for watching and I'll talk to you again soon.